so I want to focus on Sarah uh, a little bit more in this session, and um, I'm describing her as the, the despairing wife. You know, the first thing that you can say about Sarah is that she was a godly woman. Uh, twice in the New Testament, uh, she's praised first as a woman of faith in Hebrews 11 and verse 11. She's listed in that uh, hero of faith chapter. And then Peter holds, us, holds her up as the model of Christian womanhood. Uh, it, it is that she's held up by Peter in 1 Peter 3, 5, and 6 as Sarah is held up as, as someone who is the model of being a Christian woman. And so we can say that um, Sarah, uh, in Sarah we have womanhood at its very best. Um, but we will see today uh, that this godly woman struggled with doubt. And are you ready for this? She engaged in manipulation. Uh-oh. Uh, now, now, some of you women are already praying that he won't get finished by lunchtime because you don't want to hear this. But I'm going to try and get it all in, all right? So I'm going to go fast this time, right? So um, in Sarah, we have womanhood at its very best, um, but we'll see that she's riddled with doubt and, and got pulled into uh, manipulation. But here's the great news, guys, is that God persevered in this fractured family, and grace means that God does not give up on people who mess up. Hey, that'll tweet, won't it? God will not give up on people who mess up. Uh, hope is for fractured people and fractured families. So in this session, turn with me to Genesis chapter 18, if you will. And the story begins with Abraham sitting at the door of his tent. Abraham uh, in Genesis 8 and verse 1, and he sees three men. And, um, and, and it's amazing here. Three times we're told in this story that once again, God himself appeared to and spoke to Abraham. In verse 1, the Lord appeared to him. In verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you. In verse uh, 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? What I I'm giving you those scriptures, Genesis 8.1, Genesis 18.10, Genesis 18.13, and you'll find that the word Lord is capitalized, all right? Uh, and, and that's there on purpose. It, it is um, printed in four capital letters, L-O-R-D, Lord, which is uh, the Hebrew word which means Yahweh, the great I am. So God Almighty came for dinner with Abraham. All right, so he, he talked with Abraham as he would talk to a friend, the scripture says. And uh, the New Testament calls this, what um, tells us that God became a man in Christ Jesus. But before that, as I said in the first sessions, there were multiple um, times when it was that God appeared as a man, making himself visible in the Old Testament. And why does he do that? Listen, he does that because God wants friendship with people like us. Amen? It, hey, just let that sink in. That ought to blow the top of your mind. God wants friendship with people like us. You think you don't match up, you don't, you know, and you, you want to hide from God whenever he's around. But I want to tell you that as far as God is concerned, he wants friendship with you. Uh, and he wants friendship with people like us. So we have God appearing in human form as a man, flanked by two angels who are all also looking like men. And they come in to share the meal in Abraham's house. Verse 2 of chapter 18. When he saw them, he ran to the door of his tent uh, to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Now you notice there that when Abraham says, O oh Lord, don't pass by, he uses not the L-O-R-D capitalized, he uses uh, the, the, the smaller letters for Lord, um, which means sir or master. 
Uh, it, it is a term of respect that Abraham used, indicating that Abraham at this moment didn't realize that he was in the presence of God. And, and this is where we're introduced to his perplexed wife. I love what happens next because it now breaks into us imagining the domestic tension. Three visitors arrived unexpectedly. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Three visitors arrived unexpectedly, and um, Abram went quickly into the tent to Sarah, and it says in verse 6, he says, quick, three seers of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. So here's Sarah, you know, and, and, uh, and she's there, and suddenly he's coming in with this order, you know, uh, you know, get the flour and, and make three cakes. Talk about fast food. Uh, it was that Sarah's instant bakery swings into action. Um, when I read this story, I, I'm always reminded of a time during the first year of our marriage that I had invited a friend to stay with us and promptly forgot to tell Letty. Late one night, there was a knock at the door. And I opened the door and I said, Oh, Robin, it was my cousin Robin. Robin, how, saying it out loud, Robin, how great to see you. Let me take your cases up to your bedroom. And Letty's over in the room going, and, and, um, in our bedroom later, I was whispering, I'm really sorry. I messed up. I completely forgot about this. He's only going to be here for five days. <laughs> <laughs> that was a moment. That was a moment when I was shown amazing grace, which, you know, leads to, as grace always should, substantial repentance. It cost me for a long time after that, as we worked through it, it was a, a little bit like Sarah here, except for the fact that um, it was no fault on the part of Abraham. God simply showed up. The visit of, the heaven, of heaven uh, just appeared, and God came to this fractured home and this fractured family. Uh, you may have not picked it up yet today. I, I don't know whether you've got it yet today, but, but I don't know what you were expecting, but God is coming into your fractured life. He's coming into your fractured home. He's coming into your fractured family. Hey, listen, you thought it's all been going on undercover and no one knew about it and everyone, you know, we're looking happy in church and everyone, but God, God has seen it all. There's nothing can be hid from him. And, and he loves you so much that he's brought you to this place and he's coming in on your life. He's coming whether you want it or not. He's coming because he loves you so much. And Abram and Sarah were blessed for opening their homes to these visitors. And you will be blessed if you open your hearts to God coming to you today and speaking into your life. Now, a little bit about Sarah. I want you to see that unbelief crept in on this godly woman. The visitor said, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said in verse 9, she's in the tent. Now, the heavenly visitors, remember it's God and two angels, um, they made sure that Sarah was within earshot. Although they first spoke to Abraham, they were, they were, what they were about to say was for her. And, and this is what they said. God himself speaks. And the Lord said in verse 10, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abram and Sarah were all, all old. They were old. They were advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Now, you know women. You know what that means, I suppose. The way of women had ceased with Sarah. In other words, she couldn't have children. So Sarah laughed to herself. 
saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? <laughs> when she said, my Lord, she was talking about Abraham. After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, when Abram is old, shall I have pleasure? Sarah believed in God, but she didn't exercise faith in what God could do. She believed in God, but she didn't have faith that God could do anything great in her life and with regard to the promise. You know, it's possible for you to have a trust in God with regards to your eternal salvation, but you fail to believe you have doubt that he can change your situation, that he can change where you are right now and the things that are going on in your life. You can believe I've got eternal salvation, but as far as my home is concerned, this is how it is and how it's always going to be. And so you have doubt in the midst of your trust in God. It seems to me that Abraham had some responsibility here because in Genesis 17, the chapter before, you will see that God had previously appeared to Abraham and given the promise that Sarah would have a son. Verse 17 of chapter 17, Abram heard this, he laughed. Okay, so he laughed first. Uh, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, also bear a child? Verse 17 of chapter 17. And if you read the rest of the chapter, chapter 17, you will find that, that it was that now God pressed the promise into Abraham. It was that by the end of the chapter, Abraham believed. So when Abraham hears this the second time in chapter 18, he doesn't laugh. You don't read of him laughing in chapter 18, but Sarah does, which indicates this. Listen, it is the fact that she was hearing the promise for the first time. Abraham, the father of many nations. Abraham, the man of faith and power. Why? Why hasn't Abraham already told Sarah about the promise? Why, why, why hasn't he told that? Why is he not ministering the word into his wife? He's in trouble again. Hey, he's in trouble again. Yeah, <laughs> we always are. Perhaps he didn't want to get her hopes up. Maybe he didn't think that she would believe and... Uh, but here we have this great man of faith, the, faith the, the father of the faithful, and he has not taken spiritual leadership in his home. Abraham hasn't been building up his wife's faith. Perhaps that's why God didn't rebuke Sarah for laughing. He rebukes Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? In other words, do you mean to tell me you've not told your wife what I told you? <laughs> and, 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 and it is that, Abraham, why haven't you been cultivating faith in your wife? I'm sorry to get on to the men again, but the fact is we've got to do it. You've been so concerned about all you're doing in your work and your ministry, you haven't been building your wife up. Abram, you have some responsibility here. I gave Sarah to you and I gave you a promise for her. Why is she laughing, Abraham? But Sarah also had responsibility. She was a godly woman. She was a model of faith of Christian womanhood. But even Sarah struggled with unbelief. And more than that, she tried to cover it up before the Lord. Listen to me careful on this point, if you will, ladies. It seems that Sarah came out of the tent and she speaks directly to God. Now, remember, it's God she's speaking to. And she tells him an outright lie. Hey, how many know if you're going to lie, you don't lie to God? And she says in verse 15, but Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. Afraid of what? Was she afraid of perhaps of what was going on in her heart? She talks to God, but she knows that the prayer is a pretense, and she knows she's covering up. Actually, behind Sarah's unbelief is an extraordinary story of manipulation. 
Because if you go back to chapter 16, you find that it begins in verse 1 like this. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. So Sarah wants a child. There's nothing surprising about all that. But here's the thing. She's prepared to go to any lengths to get what she wants. And, and, and there's no doubt about what she's driving at. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall, I shall obtain a child through her. And Abram listens to the voice of Sarah and his union with Hagar. He makes love to Hagar and and now that leads to the birth of Ishmael. And this fractured family is now plunged. It's plunged into a web of conflicting hidden resentments. We have in this story the story of a woman who uses her power to get what she wants. She does this way in a way that dishonors God and big brings pain to everyone around her. I, 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 I didn't know how to say what I want to say next, and so I googled it. <laughs> and I found the list that I wanted. It's a list that's by an unknown lady. She didn't want a name put to it. But a, but a lady put, put a name to this. Um, this is what she said. Listen to what she said. Women innately recognize that they have power over men and can use that to get what they want. She then suggested nine ways married women might manipulate their husband. Now, do you want me to say it or not, ladies? Are you ready for this? All right, here we go. You may want to write it down, men, because you may want to use these titles. She said, number one, the leaky faucet. Complaining and nagging until she, he gives you what you want. A leaky faucet. And then there's the trial lawyer. Verbally out-talking him and shutting him down with her verbal skills. The, the trial lawyer. You know, women talk three times as much as men, but I'm not going to say anything about that. All right. Then the blame game. Making her husband feel like he is responsible for her unhappiness, anger, or sadness. If only you made more money. If only you were home more. If only you had a better job. The blame game. And then there is the clue factor, C-L-U-E, clue factor, expecting him to read her mind but giving him little in ways of clues, sighing, pouting, giving one-word answers, but when he asks what's wrong, she answers nothing. You know about it. Ah, she knows. Smoke signals is number five. Smoke signals. Banging pots and pans around in the kitchen to make a point that you're doing the dishes without actually coming out and asking for help. Smoke signal. Waterworks. Waterworks. Most men don't like to see women crying. So even when he thinks he's right, he'll usually soften to stop the crying. Angling. You know, angling, look, that means putting bait out. You ready? Withholding sex or using sex to get what she wants. The guilt trip, guilt trip. Number eight, laying guilt on him, 
telling him how disappointed she is in him, the guilt trip. And then finally, the performance trap, making him feel inadequate. We're the only ones, you know, who haven't been to Disney World. We're the only ones who haven't. You're not performing right. You know, there are multiple ways a believing woman can use her power to get what she wants in ways that dishonor God and bring pain to everyone around her. And uh, that's what Sarah was doing, and the effect of it was that unbelief crept into this godly woman, and, and, and so it goes on. Now, this is a story, of course, about God. God comes near to Sarah. His conversation with Abraham, but the purpose of his visit is to confirm the promise to Sarah. He wanted her to get the promise. He wanted her to see that the promise was for her. Picture Sarah hiding in a tent. She's not coming out to meet with God. Perhaps she was embarrassed by the weakness of her own faith and the shame of her manipulation. Maybe you know what that's like. You see, the fact is people see you as a leader. They look to you and you have certain reputation. God has given you responsibility in ministry. But when you look at your own soul, you say to yourself, what would people think if they knew how threadbare my faith is? What would people think if they really knew me on the inside? I've got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. God knows how threadbare your faith is. And the fact is that he knows about you. There's nothing hidden from him. But thank God he doesn't give up when he knows that people mess up. Nothing about you comes as a surprise to him. He set his love upon you, knowing you at your lowest, worst state, he loved you. And so he's never going to stop loving you. Use what often happens in relationships. A boy meets a girl, they see each other at their best, and both of them think that the person they've met is special. They get married, and from then on, they live their lives and uh, become, uh, it becomes an exercise in trying to make sure the other person doesn't find out what those things that you've been concealing in the courtship are actually in your life. And now you're in your marriage and you're continually trying to cover up your own weaknesses. And, 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 and it is that God sits his love on you, knowing you at your worst, Christ died for you. This means that Christ's presence is in this place and that you are completely known. I bear this word in, but we are naked before the one who knows us. There's nothing about us he doesn't know, and God exposes her unbelief. In Genesis 18, 12, Sarah laughed to herself. Notice um, it was that when the Lord comes near, Sarah did not laugh out loud. It was in her mind and in her heart. As far as Sarah was concerned, her unbelief was private. As far as Sarah was concerned, she didn't think anyone knew about her laughing. It says she laughed to herself. It was in her mind. It was in her heart. And she felt safe. And, and it's easy to do that coming to a conference and, and I look dressed right, and I speak right, and I can say hallelujah right, and I can say brother and sister right, and I can hug you right. But, but the fact is that there's stuff going on inside of me that is hidden from everyone else. But the fact is today, God wants you to know, I know about it. There's nothing hid that he doesn't see. You can't hide a thing from him. And God loves you at your worst, but he won't leave you at your worst. He wants to take you on into better thing, and he exposes her unbelief. And the reason he does it is that he wants to restore her faith. How do we know that God restores her faith? Well, this verse, Hebrews 11, 11, but by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, and she considered him faithful who had promised the Lord appeared to her a year before the birth of Isaac, so she must have conceived very soon after the unexpected visitors came to her house. 
And she received the power to be conceived, to conceived because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. Sarah's faith was restored by an encounter with God. It was that she had this encounter with God that exposed her unbelief and her manipulation and, and showed her that God would say, I, I'm never going to leave you and forsake you. I'm never going to give up on you. Even if you do the worst of sins, I'm still going to come after you. I'm going to hunt you down. And, and the fact is that now we find that she was restored by this encounter with God. She could say, as David the shepherd, and, and he said, the Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul. Um, how faith is restored, look to who God is. Genesis 18, 14, Genesis 18, 14 says this, is anything too hard for the Lord? See, the reason, the reason that her faith had gone and that she was living in doubt and manipulation was because she looked at herself. She was 90 years of age. She looked at Abraham, who was 100 years of age. And, and, and so it was that the promise seemed impossible to come to pass. She looked at Abraham and concluded, he's hopeless, and I'm not much better either. Hey, listen, our hope is not in us. It's in the Lord. Our hope is not in your spouse. It's in the Lord. Our hope is not in our children. It's in the Lord. Our faith is in God. Our hope is in God. As long as you look at the weakness of your flesh, and as long as you look at the weakness of your husband's flesh or your wife's flesh, or as long as you look at the weakness of your children, you will drift into doubt and you will begin to manipulate to make things better. But when your eyes are on the Lord and you say, my God is in control, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now your faith begins to soar again. You are restored in your faith. Is anything too hard for me, says the Lord. Faith is restored when you get your eyes off yourself and your problems. And you get your eyes off your limitations and your failures. And now you come and you put them onto the living God. The Lord for whom nothing is impossible. Very quickly, I'm coming to the end here. So be patient with me. Listen to what God says. At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. And she had the son. His name was Isaac. Genesis 21, verses 1 to 3. Now, if you're 80 or 90 here today, it does not mean that you're going to conceive and have children, all right? <laughs> but how does that speak to us today? The um, revealed purpose of God for Sarah's life, his plan for her life was at 90 years of age, she was going to have a son. That was his plan. It had always been his plan. He had never changed his mind about his plan. It, it was his plan when he called them out of where they were, the country where they were, told them to go to the land of promise. It, it, it was always in his mind, she will have a son when she's 90 years of age. And not only that, the plan will go on because out of that son will come Jesus himself. The Messiah will be born through the line that's going to come because God had a purpose for that woman's life that was going to come to pass. The point of the promise is simply, my purpose for your life will be fulfilled Everything, listen, listen, ladies, listen, ladies, everything that God has purposed for your life is going to come to pass. I, I don't care. I don't care what it is that's gone wrong in the journey. I don't care what's happened that's, uh, that's shook you up. I don't care what attempts the enemy has made on your uh, bringing you to a place of doubt. I don't care what manipulation you have done. But I want you to know God's not changed his mind about your purpose and your destiny and what he wants to do with your life. 
He still is on track with what he's going to do in your life. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you that God has a plan. He's going to bring it to pass. He's not finished. He's not done with you. You may feel you've messed up totally. You may feel it's all gone wrong in this way and that way. My family, my friends, my church, my whatever. But God says, I've not forgotten you. I've not forgotten my promise. I've not forgotten that I've got great destiny for your life. So what God has promised, he will bring to pass. Maybe you're married and longing for children and it's not happening. Listen. I don't know what's going to happen in that area, but I know this. God will accomplish his plan for your life. You you may be here today, and and, and it is that um, uh, you're married and wishing that your marriage was more than it is. I want to tell you that God has a plan for your life, and that plan is going to come to pass No matter where your marriage is right now, it comes from your surrender to his will and saying, not my will, but your will be done. Not my manipulation and my doubt, but my trust is in you. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And and it is, you may be here today and, and you're anxious for your children, wondering what path they will go on, wondering what's going to happen with their life. I want to tell you, friends, that, that the promise of God is this, is that as you feed into them, uh, it will be that they may wander for a while, but they will come back. I give you that as a promise. But the fact is this, as far as you are concerned, your children's failure or your children's wandering and your children's whatever is not going to hinder God from bringing to pass his plan for your life. It is now certain going to happen. Some of you feel that God's purpose for your life will come to pass if my husband will shape up. Do you know what you've done? Listen, this is serious. You know what you've done when you say that? If only my husband will shape up, you've just put your husband in the place of God. Because now he's the responsible, he's going to be the responsible one for God's plan for my life coming to pass. Hey, your husband cannot take the place of God. I I, I want to tell you, it's not your husband that's going to bring God's purpose to pass in your life. It is God himself that's going to do that. Your husband's not going to do it, and your wife is not going to do it for you, man. You cannot put your wife in the place of God. You've got to know God for yourself and say, this God is the God of the impossible, and he is the one that's going to bring my purpose and my destiny to pass. Now I've got to finish. So here's my advice to women that comes from the scripture. So it's not from me, it's from the word, all right? Do you still love me, ladies? All right. First word, quit, quit manipulation. Manipulation is using your power to get what you want in a way that dishonors God and brings pain to everyone involved. Learn to recognize manipulation whenever you see it and quit it. Here's the second bit of advice. Confront unbelief. Unbelief is a weed that grows in darkness. It hates the light of day, so confront unbelief. You do that as you quit pretending and recognize unbelief for what it is and look to God and listen to what he says. So now you confront unbelief and say, no, I'm not going to believe that. That's a lie from hell. That's a lie from the devil. That's a lie in my mind. I'm going to arrest that thought. And I'm going to hold it in captivity. I'm not going to allow this to happen. And now we confront unbelief. And then accept and grow in the grace of God. One prophet said, your gentleness made me great. God was very gentle with Sarah. He's gentle with you. He knows about you already. 
There's nothing about you that he doesn't know. You can approach him with great confidence because he said nothing's going to hold me back. And listen, this is the last thing. A promise is a promise. You know, there's a movie out there called It Could Happen to You. And this movie, um, Nicolas Cage plays the part of a New York cop who walks into a li little ca uh, cafe and, and he orders a cup of coffee. When he's ready to leave, he reaches back and realizes he's misplaced his wallet. And um, the struggling young waitress, played by Bridget Fonda, uh, she figures out that she's been duped. And, um, and the, the cop, he pulls out of his pocket a lottery ticket from, uh, and, and, and he promises this. He says, listen, I know I can't pay for my coffee, but listen, if I win this lottery ticket, I'm going to split it 50-50 with you. Well, in the providence or whatever, he wins. And even though he isn't under any legal obligation, and against the advice of his friends and those around him, and at extreme financial cost, he keeps his promise to the waitress in the corner cafe. And he repeats the phrase over and over throughout the movie, a promise is a promise. You see, the value of his word outweighed the value he placed on the lottery ticket. And I want you to know today, God will keep his word to you. Hey, listen, some of you, some of you, you had promises given to you for your life from God. You may be in a prophetic word. It may have been a word of scripture. It may have been someone preaching. You had a prophetic thing spoken into your life. It has gone on for years and years and years and nothing has happened, it seems to you. And you even put it off and says, that can't happen now. That's not going to happen now. That promise won't be kept. But God is going around every day looking at you, seeing you, and saying, a promise is a promise. I never, I never make a promise that I don't keep, says God. I never come, my word, my word will stand. He says, I honor my word above my name, and I'm going to bring to pass the promise that I've made to you. A promise is a promise. God will not let you down. I have promises coming to pass in my life now as a 70-year-old guy, nearly 70. I'm only 69. But I have promises come to pass that were made to me by God when I was in my 20s. I, I want to tell you, don't give up on your promise. All right. Edwin, what, what can I do? Quickly pray. Listen, uh, you've got to be at lunch in five minutes. But I want, to, I, I, I want to give you all a prophetic word. But it's going to be one word to you all. All right. Now, ladies, if God has spoke to you and you say, I'm going to take this word today, I want you to stand right now. You say, God, you've spoke right into my heart. I want you to know that there's a new day coming for women in this nation. And there's a new day coming for you in your situations. I believe the day of the Lord for women has come. Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I could go into that in a deeper way to, to show you that. In God's eyes, he is no respecter of persons. And some of you have been given gifts by God and you, you hold them down because you don't want to usurp the authority of a man. And that's good. But God says there's a time when your gifts have got to be seen and, and where you now step in to be in what God has promised. You see, your doubt and your unbelief holds you back back here where you think, I can't, I can't, I can't, and can't. And God says, why don't you take a step of faith and trust me with the promise? 
I promised that I would use you. I promised that you would be a mighty vessel. I promised that you'd have prophetic words. I promised that you would carry healing to the sick. I promised that you would see your kids raised up to my glory. He says, I want you to grab my promise again and say, I'm going from doubt to faith. I'm going from manipulating, trying to work my life out, manipulating my way through. I'm going to a place of faith and trust that says, God, nothing is impossible to you. And you can take me wherever you want to take me and do with me whatever you want to do with me. I surrender my life to you. And right now, you know who I'm talking to. You know that God is speaking to you and you are finding a reviving and a restoring inside that is saying, I'm gripping on to the promises of God. And if you're doing that, I want you to raise your hand and grip, grip, grip on to the promises of God. Now in the name of Jesus.